Yo, yo, Coach Brad here. I'm on a little bit of a little bit of a delay. Not as much of a delay as when I do my play and explain videos for Poker Coaching Premium. So I'm not used to sure how to react in real time. But welcome to this free webinar on Crushing Cash Game. Gonna throw you some tips in just a few moments, um, and then we're gonna. Uh, end with a live Q&A. Uh, I have chat somewhere. I don't know where it is. My my windows are all uh, everywhere. What's up, Jay Fleming and everybody else? Jacob, the one and only Jacob in the world. Welcome. How are you doing, sir? Um, yeah, let's dive into this webinar first and foremost, and then we'll hit it to the Q&A. Uh, my overlay is a little bit too overlay so I can't put the chat in there, but um, I'll pull the chat up when we get to the live Q&A. Hopefully, I don't miss anything. Um, what's up, Mr. Hoffman? How are you doing, sir? Crush Cash Games. Uh, cash Games, alliteration, crush, all the things. Why you should listen to me. So who am I? I think it's pretty clear that I'm not Jonathan Little. I don't know if you've noticed that yet by the way that I sound and look. I know that there will inevitably be YouTube comments asking who I am um, or saying you know, the, the joke of like, Jonathan, you look and sound differently than you normally do. Uh, ha ha, ha ha. Uh, I guess whoever wants to do that first. Be my guest. I'm not Jonathan Little. I'm Coach Brad. Um, why you should listen to me, my cats do not, but you should. I've been a professional poker player for 17 years, actually. Um, but for 16 years, it was my sole source of income. Now I create content. I'm a poker coach. I have my own courses. I have a podcast you may or may not have heard of called Chasing Poker Greatness. I uh, tweet. You can see right above me right there. Oh. You can see my arm. My arm's out of the overlay at CPG Podcast. Uh, right now, my, my most recent tweet was setting the over and under for how many times I can leave a black ink pen in my pants um, before my wife divorces me. The current number is at seven. I give it nine to 10, and we're just, we're done. Uh, but yeah, I've been a professional poker player for 16 years. It's been my sole source of income. I'm a cash game specialist. Uh, I'm the host of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. I don't know why that qualifies me, um, you know, me as a coach to listen, uh, for you to listen to me, but I don't know. It's just a thing. Uh, cheap plug. My core values impact. That's the thing that drives me. Uh, I, li I want to make an impact on the people who listen to me, the people that I encounter in the poker world, I want to help them improve their poker games and I take their struggles very, very personally. Everybody tells me not to take struggles personally, but I do. It's just how I am built. Um, I genuinely care about whether or not you're improving, whether or not you're reaching your poker goals, doing the things that you want to do in this world. Um, and because I take it personally, I try hard. <laughs> I, I try hard to uh, explain things in ways that resonates and generates impact. Uh, and so with that said, three tips to help you crush cash games. Um, fixing just a few leaks in your game can result in massive increases to your hourly win rate, or at least they can stop you from sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I think that ultimately at the end of the day, as great as three tips are, this is a journey. It's a long process. There are struggles. Um, but with the struggles, if you keep working hard, you keep studying, you keep learning, you keep growing, there is triumph and there are ways to gain an edge. You just have to be resilient and keep going. Hard to keep going if you're at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then in today's webinar, you're going to get three actionable tips, just the tips, you can use to upgrade your game. And then there's going to be a live, not a dead Q&A at the end of this webinar. Um, so stick around for that. You can ask me general questions, mostly about poker, not about laundry or pins. Um, that's a, 
Uh, I'm not very good at that, but all the poker, general poker questions, feel free to fire them my way. Um, so tip number one is going to be to stop calling preflop raises with a wide range. Uh, typically this is going to be offsuit hands, right? Like a lot of offsuit hands, combinatorically speaking, and by combinatorically, I mean the number of combos that you have. There are 12 offsuit combos of say king queen, whereas the suited version, there are four. So if you keep playing a bunch of offsuit combos, you just end up playing too many hands. You get to the flops too wide, and then players can abuse you because you are not managing your ranges correctly, right? Um, three betting from the low jack, the high jack, and the small blind when facing a raise is good, okay? Uh, so you don't want to flat typically from those positions. You want to be three betting or folding. And this is just good advice really around uh, across the board, not just in high rake environments, but you don't want to flat in those spots. You want to be three betting or folding. And then you do get to call often from the button because you have, you get to have positional advantage for the rest of the hand. You can defend appropriately when the bit, when the blinds squeeze, um, position is kind of important in this game. I know that it's said over and 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 over again, but position is paramount. You can't, you can't really, uh, I can't overstate the power of position as it relates to this game of poker. Um, things to look for that will allow you to call slightly wider. By the way, this presentation is 20 slides. Um, had help uh, from the poker coaching team putting it together. I don't know if they realize quite how quickly I go through slides, but um, this hour-long presentation may end up being like 13 minutes, and then we'll just stare at each other, I guess, the rest of the 40 minutes. But um, things to look for to allow you to call slightly wider. You've got weak or passive players behind you, so you can call wider whenever you're not at, you're, you're less at risk of getting squeezed out of the pot. Um, or the initial opener is so tight, a Tennessee Titan, which I am a fan, um, or the nit, or a Nittany Lion, uh, that your calling range is protected from getting squeezed, right? Um, so basically, if the tightest player in the world opens, you can call a little bit wider because no sane human being is going to be squeezing uh, that tight player very often. So again, it's relative to the players behind you, how often they're three betting, um, whether or not you get to flat. And then the third thing to look for is that the initial opener is a passive losing player who will dissuade future squeezing. So if uh, the initial opener is a passive player um, who good players are not just going to go out of their way to build a pot out of position with some hands like ace five suited, ace four suited, ace three suited, ace two suited, uh, eight nine suited, nine ten suited, jack ten suited, those type of hands. Um, that's going to dissuade them from squeezing. The major, major point here is that whenever players behind you for one reason or another, um, aren't, are less likely to squeeze, then you can flat more often, right? So tip number one, just the tip, stop calling preflop raises with a wide range. Um, online six max cash games. These are free implementable six max charts. Uh, you can see the link down there. That's quite the link. I can't, uh, I'm just going to do it. Pages.pokercoaching.com slash the number six, max, dash, GTO, dash, charts. Uh, quite a mouthful, those charts. Um, but online six max cash games, pretty high rake equals very aggressive strategies. So knock it off with the flatting bucko. Um, yes, I said it. I know that that may be offensive to some of you, but I did say it, bucko. Um, 100 big blind cutoff versus low jack strategy you see that you're three betting 8.6% of hands. That's 114 
combinations of hands. Um, you can see that you're three betting here, ace king, ace queen, and king queen. Uh, only three, three hands that are offsuit versus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine suited hands. Um, and then also eights plus. And then here from the small blind versus the button, you're going to be three betting wider than the cutoff versus the low jack. Why are you three betting wider when you're in the small blind facing a button open? And I know that we don't have the chat replay here, so I will read your answers out loud or read your responses. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Um, why, why are you supposed to three bet from the small blind facing a button open much wider than the cutoff versus the low jack? Nobody, nobody go too fast here. Okay, okay, I guess we, we got more than three tips today since nobody knows the answers. Ah, there we go. There are the answers. They're coming in. The button has a wifer range. Whew, a wifer. I don't know what that means, but yes, you got a, you got a three bet more versus the wifer range. <laughs> yeah, the, the button's wider. Um, the button's opening much wider than the... I forget that I'm on a delay. I'm like a 10-second delay here. So, um, yeah, so the low jack's going to be opening a tighter range because they have less information than the button because the low jack does not know what the cutoff and the, uh, the cutoff's going to do. And the button does know what the cut cutoff has done because they have folded, right? Um, so they have more information and the button's opening wider. And typically when villains are opening a wider range, you get to three bet them more frequently, right? So that's why 8.6% from, uh, cut off facing a low jack open and then 15.1% in the small blind facing a button open almost two times the amount of hands. Whew, we made it to the 12-minute mark. I was I was really concerned, but we got there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we're we're just on the first tip. Like we we may go over. Uh, here's some more grids. Um, the GTO eight max charts within Poker Coaching Premium. You can see the hundred big blind cutoff versus low jack. There's a bunch of mixed strategies in in here. Um, there's some calls and some three bets but this is with a no yeah, no rake so timed rake only um you're going to be less aggressive you can flat some more um you know since there's no drop they're not going to drop seven dollars every time you see a flop uh if you're playing a time rate game which means you get to see more flops you get to play more hands um but still not a ton of offsuit hands just ace king ace queen and king queen so again, bucko, knock it off with all of the offsuit hands. And then the small blind versus the button looks to be a little bit wider. But again, even in time rate game, uh, you're still three betting. There's not a flat strategy here. I'm not saying that it's inconceivable to have a flat strategy. And I do think that you ought to incorporate some flats given uh, specific game conditions or game configurations, as I like to say. But in general, you're three betting or folding from the small blind. I'm one of those annoying poker coaches that will almost refuses to say things in absolutes. Like there's sometimes there's a time and a place to flat in the small blind, um, but. Really, first and foremost, you need to get down your baseline strategies so that you can figure out the data points you need to look at and analyze and prioritize that will allow you to deviate. Um, okay. Stop calling preflop raises with a wide range. We still have we have another slide to get through. Big blind defending ranges with deep stack. It's not only about how much equity you have when out of position. It's about how well you're able to realize that equity. Um, so big blind versus low jack. Yeah, it looks like we're three betting 5.7% according to the GTO ranges. 
um, on poker coaching. And then from the big blind facing the button, we're three betting 13.4%, which is a lot of hands, right? Like we have four or five suited, suited connectors all the way up to ace king suited, um, one gappers from nine, seven, all the way up to ace queen. And then a couple of two gappers from jack eight suited on up ace four, ace five, ace six. Um, and I think that's a judgment call here with the a6 specifically like you can also do a3 instead of a6 but i guess a6 has a little bit less playability so it's like your worst suited ace to flat with um but yeah basically you're three betting a lot um in the second strategy uh big blind versus button you are flatting a ton too and the reason why you flat from the big blind is you close the action you get to realize your equity um and the button tends to have a very wide range, which allows you to just defend wider, right? Let me check out the chat here. Um, Alan says that I almost always avoid using absolutes. Uh, Alan, I can always count on Alan for the clever, the clever comments. Um, Jay Fleming says three bet four five suited in big blind versus button. According to these charts right here, it says you do. Um, you could also, you know, it could be interchangeable with the six eight versus the four five, but really, you're supposed to three bet wider from the big blind than you might imagine, um, even though you are closing the action. Uh, else, the button gets to over realize equity. Uh, if the button is a weak player then you can three bet even more than these charts suggest. So you can deviate beyond the baseline strategies, but this is all well and good versus GTO Joe, but raising stations and Larry at one, two versus raising stations and Larry at one, two. Wow. This is so, so many rhymes in this. Um, not sure he's defending and betting at the correct frequencies. If villain is not defending and betting at the correct frequencies, this allows you to deviate in very specific ways. So if they are over defending, then maybe you are under three betting, right? Like if they're under defending, then you're going to over three bet, right? Or maybe they fold the C bets at a very high frequency. Um, the more that villains stray away from GTO Joe, the more we're able to find exploits and then execute them. And that's sort of on us as the poker player, right? But, you know, to understand the exploit, you need to understand the baseline strategy that that exploit is born from. Um, because if you understand the baseline strategy, then you understand how to exploit from there based on the deficiencies in your opponent's game. So it all starts by learning the good baseline strategies. Uh, Peter Brotman says, compared to mine, how much do these charts differ? I'm not sure. That's a whole other can of worms, Mr. Brotman. No more wifer talk out of you. Um, tip number two, double barrel early and often versus wide ranges. So we moved beyond the first tip. Uh, number two, when you bet small in the flop, players will continue very often as they should. Uh, why do players continue very often versus a small bet? That's because they're getting a good price. Um, they typically have a lot of equity. And especially if you're playing against weaker players, well, they like calling, uh, especially on the flop versus a small bet. So they will defend very often versus a small bet. When this happens, players typically have a very difficult time defending their wide and typically capped range on later streets, allowing you to pour on the heat on favorable turns and rivers. Does everybody know what we mean by capped ranges here? Um, and why do you think villains have a difficult time defending their wide range? Going to have to wait seven seconds uh, i think that's the delay it's a good club mr brotman it's a good club one thing that that i think is important to note too about pre-flop play is like you know it's like the books in your bookshelf that you buy and then you go to sleep and hope that you 
uh, learn through osmosis, you really need to bear down and invest your energy into learning the things that you have access to, right? Like it's not worth anything unless you invest the time to learn them. Um, Skyliner says too much junk. Rollo, welcome Rollo, says it's hard to make a hand. Can't meet MDF. Cap range equals no monsters. So the way that I think about poker is that at every single decision point, you have multiple options that you take with multiple hands that you have in your range, right? So if villain check raises the majority of their strong hands on the flop or most of their strong hands, and then they also on top of that defend very, very wide, well, because of that, um, there's reduction in the number of good hands that they have on the turn that they show up with on the turn. So if you always check raise your sets, if you always check raise your two pair, well, when you just call now you lack sets and two pair in your turn range and that caps you. Um, and so ranges can be capped in many different ways, but basically it's because they, they play their hand in such a fashion that they just don't have good hands on future streets. Right. Um, Oh man, we, we got more, we got more jokes in the chat by Alan talking about big hats, Alan, look at your avatar right there. You got the biggest hat of them all. Um, okay. So when this happens, players typically have a difficult time defending their wide ranges. So they have a wide range. Tip number one, don't play so many offsuit hands, right? Well, if the villains you're playing against are playing all these offsuit hands, they have too many combos to manage correctly. Really, that's what we do as poker players. We manage our combos. We manage the hands that we play. Um, and so they do a really horrible job of managing their combos. When you just have too many hands at your disposal, it's very easy to get out of balance, and it's very easy to get exploited, right? Um, and so... When choosing bluffs, typically the deeper the stack to pot ratio, uh, the more you should ha care about having equity with your bluffs when you barrel the turn. Um, so by deeper the stack to pot ratio, that means you know if there's ten dollars in the pot. Uh, deep stack to pot ratio is like two hundred dollars, right? Like it's twenty x SPR. Um, and then if you have $10 in the pot and you've got $3 behind, well, now your SPR is only 0.3, right? Um, Dunk Achino says, does anyone have any tips against players that don't four bet pre? Don't know how many times I've lost lots of chips by being out kicked ace queen versus ace king. Uh, if players don't four bet pre flop a ton, then you can either three bet them, uh, with your value, so very very value heavy. You can also three bet them much wider because four betting is a natural defense versus three bets. Uh, if villains don't four bet appropriately, then you can just three bet them uh, way more often. Take a flop with initiative, and then you know start c betting or figuring out how they're mismanaging their ranges on future streets so that you can exploit their strategies. Right. Um, you can also think about blockers. How does your hand interact with your opponent's natural calls and natural folds? So by that, you know, blockers, oh man, I got something in my eye. It's going to get me. Uh, like you say, you have king queen on like jack seven deuce. Um, you block king jack, you block queen jack. Uh, if you have queen 10 on like jack seven deuce again, the queen and the 10 are around surrounding the 10. So you block queen Queen Jack and Jack 10. Um, and so the more combos, the more hands you block that make it more difficult for your villain to have their natural continues, um, then you can pour on the heat and do some more bluffing. And now we're going to make a long and scary trip to the world of Chrome and the browser. I can't believe that they, the poker coaching team, Jonathan Little, entrusted me to switch to Chrome in the middle of a live presentation, but I'm going to give it my all. Boom. Not, wasn't as difficult as I thought. I set it up pretty well. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Now I need to find the Chrome. Okay, we got the Chrome. Shiny and Chrome. 
we got the king six. It looks like we are playing some five ten no limit here. Everybody's got one hundred big blinds. That's very convenient for our educational purposes here. Glad that everybody topped up to a hundred. Uh, the big blind defends, and we get a queen five deuce flop. So queen five deuce rainbow. We have a back door. Flush draw and an overcard, likely the best hand, a uh, large percentage of the time as well. So we go ahead and we start out by betting here. There's 55 in the pot. We bet 14, um, which is, I, I don't know the math there. That's a, <laughs> let's see, it's two no's, 30%, 30% pot or so, something like that. Um, villain defends, and then there's 83 we turn our king six uh, spades. We turn a flush draw. Uh, villain checks, and we bet speed limit, 55. And the villain folds. That's very, very good. Um, and I think that, like, you can three bet. You, you can see bet even wider than this on the turn. Um, you don't need necessarily need to turn uh, additional equity because when villain calls the flop, they're going to call with a lot of fives. They're going to call with some ace highs. They're going to call with some gut shots. Um, so their range is very wide. But if villain defends on the turn, what do you think is next? Especially if you're using larger turn size bets. Um, what do you? What do we think that's going to funnel to the river? And we can go to the the peanut gallery. Some of the some of the funny funny comments while I wait for this silly delay to leave. Um, uh, no, no funny comments. We we got no nothing that I can pull from here here in the chat. Nahum Nahum. Uh, I apologize if I'm butchering your name. Villa says, this is very helpful. Thanks, Brad and Jonathan Little. Um, with a large bet on the turn and a call, it's time to check the river. If they call the larger bet, they are mostly on single pairs. Uh, so really what you ought to bear in mind is that when they do call the turn, they're going to have stronger hands, right? It's condensed. They started out on the flop very wide. Um, and that's fine. That's what we were looking for. Then on the turn, we go polarized. And once we go polarized and villain continues, their range is stronger on the river, right? Um, Bad News Bert says we're likely beat. That's true. We have a king, king and a six. Um, Alan says the villain continues with their better hands that did not check raise the flop. They fold their junk. That's true. But basically, the key point here is that when you bet the turn, um, you know, careful about betting the river, right? William Tappanass in Cash Games, what sizes are you C betting with? Does it change based on board connectivity? It will change. It'll change based on board connectivity. It'll change based on, you know, the game, the table configuration. Um, it'll change based on a number of factors. So it's it's hard to just say point blank and and but yeah I think the sizes are going to change based on various future factors. Now we can close this window, move to the second hand that has been prepared for me. Um, we got a jack and ten from the cutoff. This is very close to the bottom of your opening range. I assume we're gonna open it because sharing a hand with you where we just fold preflop would be well it'd be something um so two five we open to 15 villain calls we got our jack and a 10 and villain checks we start out by betting one third again a little under one third about 30 percent villain continues the turn is a king um this is an advantageous card it's an over card to the board um and for what it's worth over cards on the turn are typically over folded uh and also over bluffed by pros just a little um <laughs> little little tip there uh, because they're over folded typically the pros will over bluff on the over card turns um but yeah king on the turn 
and we pick up an open and straight draw villain checks and we go for a pot size polarizing bet in this case um, speaking of the river i do think that villains tend to raise with their two pair here and so this uh, a flat on the turn would likely cap their range um, especially if you know they're somewhat of an inexperienced player they won't understand that by raising all of their sets all of their top two pair that leaves their range capped and vulnerable to river aggression um, so in this case even though we polarize on the turn because we get this favorable turn card um, pulling the trigger on the river i think is going to yield some fruits right um and villain calls so now we have this situation where we get to bet on the river. I'm very glad that, that this was set up in a way that allows us to bet again, and we just go for it, right? We bet 150. Villain folds um, by betting 150, and let's just pretend that we bet pot. How often does a pot size bet on the river? Uh, pot size investment need to work to be profitable here when you are the aggressor. How often do you need your villains to fold? You have no lifelines left. No ask the audience. It's all on you. Because it's a very important thing to bear in mind when you're choosing to bluff on the river is how often, how often does this need to work for me to win monies? Keith Dunlap says 50%. Man, Jay Little has you guys trained up, uh, except for Daniel and HL. Sorry, guys. I, I spoke too soon. It's 50%, right? 50%. We're risking 150 or risking 162 to win 162. Um, and if you if they fold 51%, we make the money. So 50% is how often we need to win with our bet from the opponent's perspective. And this might be Daniel and HL where you're getting a little confused um, how often do you need to win versus a pot size bet in order to call the river? Now, I, I foreshadowed. I'm giving y'all a chance to giving y'all a chance to make it back. <laughs> Redeem yourselves. Thirty three percent. I'm, Daniel hasn't said anything yet, but I'm convinced that he said 33%. He verbalized it, yelled it at his computer. The answer is 33%. Um, they're getting two to one. And when you're getting two to one, you need to win more than 33% of the time to be profitable, to call the river profitably, right? Now, let's see if we can navigate going back. Oh, we did. Look at that. All right. Tip three, increase your big bet sizes. Whew, we're on the final tip, ladies and gentlemen. Many players cap their bet sizes at 66% on the flop or 100% on the turn and river. This is a huge error. You are playing no limit hold'em, after all. We're not playing pot limit hold'em. We're playing no limit, where you can wager a spectrum of sizes from one big blind all the way up to all the chips. Um... When you have bigger bet sizes in your arsenal, you can get max value with strong hands and generate more fold equity with your bluffs. Uh, when, when to use very large bets, you can use them on the flop, on very dynamic boards, or just dynamic boards. Very, very dynamic, very, very dynamic, where we want to push equity right away, i.e. on tray 8-7 uh, tray with <laughs> CDC, um, Center for D Disease Control, um, two clubs, when you have pocket nines, uh, and then on the turn in the river, when draws miss, you're very polarized and villain is likely capped. Um, those are some spots to use some large bets. And now I believe, I hope anyway, we got some more examples. We go back to Chrome. We got, we going back to Chrome. All right, Mr. Jackton, you've had your time in the sun. Now we move on to the 10-10. Um, looks like we're playing 1K No Limit, some 510. Uh, everybody, once again, coincidentally has 100 big blinds. That's very, very good for this presentation that it's all set up that way. 
we open to 30 button folds, small blind folds, and the big blind opts to defend. The flop is 9, 7, 4 with two diamonds, so no CDC here. We have a DSD um, board, villain checks, and betting pot here with the tens. Um, now, the good news about betting pot here is that I think villains are going to struggle to find enough raises, um, enough bluff raises, uh, non-equity driven raises. We also block a lot of the 810 type hands uh, that I think may be inclined to do a lot of check raising here. So that's pretty good. Um, but using this large sizing, we do have to be very careful when we face a check raise on the flop because villain is equity driven. Um, with that said, villain does defend. Um, once villain defends, that likely caps their range. Although at these stakes, at these stakes live, I think villains are going to do a much worse job of structuring their strategies. So likely to check raise most of their top two pair, most of their sets. Um, online, they will find some flats there at these stakes. So doesn't necessarily cap the range when you're playing online. And really, you know, this is something that you ought to think about as well here. Uh, if you always check raise your sets and your two pair, well, when you call, what does that mean? It means that you're up Poop Creek with no paddle. So villain checks and versus this capped range, we go for an overbet. Um, we go for an overbet. There's a double flush draw board, so it's very easy for villain to buy that, you know, we have a flush draw. We have some sort of draw that they can call with their nine or even their seven with. When we go this polarized, um, a nine and a seven are pretty much the same hands. Um so we go over bet, and then we get this beautiful, beautiful river here. Uh, the deuce that now counterfeits all the 9-7. Most of the sets would have raised on an earlier street. Um, so, yeah, we're pretty much bulletproof at this point. Villain checks. And because both flush draws missed in this universe of hand replayer right here, in the real world, you'll get like the jack of diamonds or something uh, sometimes, you know, that's 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 what happens. But in this simulated reality, the deuce pairs, both flush draws miss, and life is good. Um, and then you jam your last 650 into the middle. Villain calls with an ace and nine. Uh, probably not great that the villain has the ace of spades, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, you can max value in these spots where villains have capped ranges. You have lots of available draws. Um, and, you know, villain is likely on the more passive side. All right. Oh boy, now we got the ace nine. I don't know where this is going. Um, so we open the ace nine offsuit from the cutoff. Again, we're it's, it's not quite our bottom of offsuit open... Ha ace x hands from the cutoff but it's close close-ish uh the big blind defends like a good little big blind um king queen six uh villain checks we go ahead and start with a third villain calls the turn is the ten of spades so we pick up an additional equity um we have a gut shot now we have the nut flush draw as well Villain checks, and we go to thirds. What's Villain going to do? Villain calls. The deuce on the river here. Villain checks, and now we go for the super polarized overbet here with our ace of spades, 9x. Remember what I just said about ace x, uh, ace 9 being the, the one of the bottom ends of our ace x hands that we raise with in the cutoff preflop so this is a hand that has no showdown value is a very natural bluff and a hand that we want to polarize with on the river here um, considering we have no pair we only have the ace high so going 150 percent likely to generate a lot of fold equity more fold equity than 75 percent or 50 percent 
but it should, right? Like if you use the big bet, it needs to work more often than the small bet um, because you lose more when you get called, right? You're risking more. So that's how that works. I think the big blind is going to be a good little lad and go ahead and fold. Well done. Well done. Um, Warlock says this is an odd bet size on the flush completing turn. It is. Yeah, uh, let me think. Nah, I mean it's not super odd. I think it's like relatively, relatively okay. Like the seventy percent size on the flush completing turn. I think the one thing that we need to really be wary of is, um, you know, the fact that how we manage our ranges on the turn. The fact that like we don't want to over bluff on the turn when we bet. I think that a lot of things that. A lot of things that villain uh, people do poorly is they don't value bet enough on flush completing turns, um, which means that we uh, we just have a natural tendency to over bluff on the turn if we're not value betting enough. If we don't bet like you know our ace king type hands or our pocket aces, it's just easy to go in the other direction of over bluffing. But we do have all the combos of ace jack offsuit as well, which is good. It's nice. Uh-oh. Yeah. I believe we win this hand. Well done. Well done, us. What does villain call with all the way to the river? Says Uga Chaka. Um, the prob... I... 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 <laughs> I don't know that this villain, um... Is a simulation. We live in a simulation. No, um... Queen Jack. Hands like that. Uh, maybe even king jack off, uh, king queen 10, so jack 10, maybe 9, 10. Um, hands like that, I, I think queen uh, queen jack, just a lot of pairs with pairs with straight draws for the most part, maybe some two pair type hands uh, like king 10. I think that's probably a hand villain's not going to raise with on the turn because it's while it is two pair, pretty scary board. We have all the combos of ace jack, all the things. All right, now we have the ace deuce of spades. We defend facing a cut off open. We could very easily make the argument here to three bet along with tip number one uh, being more aggressive, but we chose to call. We chose to call. That's how we drew it up. Um... Uh, this is weird. I think I'm I'm like out out on a limb here. I don't know. <laughs> I think I may have went too many deep into my hand histories, but let's uh, let's just keep going with it. So we face a flop. Yeah, we check. We face a flop. C bet. We defend. The turns a four. Check check. River a deuce, and I assume this is where we're okay. This is it. This is where we go with our big bet here. Um. Once the turn gets goes checked through, and then the river pairs the deuce. So polarizing bet here on the river to 75. Um, I think this is a pretty good spot to overbet, although you know we have a lot of queen x that I think can uh, overbet as well when villain doesn't continue betting on the turn. Um, even ace jack is part of our value range. Uh, we also have to consider like um, how often we raise with our king tens or nine tens. Uh, our ace jack or ace 10 type of hands on the flop to really figure out uh, how often we raise with you know our flush draws on the flop to figure out how many natural bluff candidates we have here again it's very easy to uh, be to overdo it to have pure value here and not enough bluffs but i'm gonna guess that the cutoff pays us off with a king and a jack um and I guess it's okay to, to call with King Jack there, but would I overbet Ace Jack? I think overbetting Ace Jack is pretty reasonable. I think that villains just don't um, villains don't generally check back top pair on the turn often enough. Like even hands like Queen Ten. Okay, let's get out of this Chrome world. 
Shiny and Chrome, get back to the safe confines of our webinar, our slide deck. That's it. We're 45 minutes in, and I've made it through 13 slides, which is some sort of record for me. Um, to recap, three tips to help you crush cash games. Stop calling preflop with a wide range, double barrel early and often versus wide ranges, and then increase your big bet sizes. Um, and there's going to be a live Q&A directly following this pitch. So after I shamelessly inform you all about the Poker Coaching Father's Day sale, we'll dive into the live Q&A, and I hope you have good cues so that I can give really good A's. Um, Father's Day sale again, if you're confused as to who's doing this webinar this is what jonathan little looks like i'm right here like see this this hand hand me um we're different human beings uh we have a pokercoaching.com father's day sale regular price is 99 dollars per month for poker coaching premium the sale ends on the 21st so you got four days tick tock tick tock uh, premium members get access to the Tournament Masterclass, the Cash Game Masterclass, WSOP Prep. There's going to be a W. There's going to be a live one WSOP this year. Um, I know last year it was confusing. We technically, technically we had like seven WSOPs, but we didn't have a. Well, I guess technically we had like some weird half live. It's going back to normal this year, guys. So just get excited about that. Um, preparations, 30 day tournament prep challenge, and then the 30 day cash game challenge of which I contributed seven days, uh, back in last December. So seven days, which is basically a mini course, my portion of the 30 day cash game challenge, uh, pokercoaching.com slash fathers. That's where you get the sale. Um, you can see that you can save a lot, a lot of money, $1,300 for two years, it's a lot of content. Um, be sure if you dive in, you take the plunge, that you bear down, right? That you take this seriously because as jokey and as much as I enjoy laughing as much as the next person, if you want to be successful in this game, you need to bear down. You need to do the work um, and you need to do the stuff that other people are unwilling to do, right? And really look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, Am I doing more than other folks? Like, do I deserve to be a winning poker player or not? And if you do not, um, if you can honestly say that you're not putting in the work, this is a good place to start. Dive into poker coaching. Uh, lots of content here. I've created a lot of content. Um, as we can see here, I can't believe I've made all this content for poker coaching uh, within the last year, but have a cash game learning path. So this puts you on the path to learning. That was my first initial webinar on poker coaching because the way that I like structuring things is linearly. So a starting point, and then we go from there. Um, second, My second webinar that I did was high impact language upgrades, and then hand reading upgrades, uh, finding entry points to improve your game. That was part of the 30 day New Year's challenge that you can get. Um, in-depth hand review. I, I don't remember that one. <laughs> oh, I remember now. It, that was also a part of the seven-day challenge. It was uh, me breaking down a hand in depth, piece by piece, uh, reviewing, finding entry points so that I could upgrade my own game and showing you how to you know, gain awareness of where you're struggling, uh, gain awareness of what you don't know, because until you uh, gain awareness of what you don't know, you can't really target and improve that. Um, how to keep score, build resiliency. This is a game where it's going to feel like you're getting your head just beat down and smashed and you feel obliterated and you feel, some days you feel like the smartest human in the world and then other days you feel dumber than the dumbest dummy that ever lived dumbly. Um, so how to keep score that is not monetary score so that you build resiliency. My favorite webinar that I've done on poker coaching, The en Enemy of Execution, The Invisible Roadblocks of High Performance. This was diving deep into those moments when you're playing poker where you know what to do and then something takes control of your body and your soul and you do something else and then you walk away from the poker table scratching your head and asking yourself, 
why did I do that? Why, why did I do that thing that I, that I just did that I did not want to do and I knew to do better? Um, and then developing study habits for growth. Everybody needs better study habits or everybody just needs study habits in general. Uh, student cash game Q&A. Data point library. This is observing data points, prioritizing them while you're playing poker. Um, spoiler alert, prioritization is often more important than the data points themselves. And at all decision points, even if you're lost, you have to prioritize something, right? You weigh multiple things and then you choose one to take priority. Um, and then my latest webinar is the home game survival guide. Part one, part one was logistically what to expect when you're playing in private games, some of the pitfalls, um, just some of the bad stuff that can happen along with some of the good reasons to play in private games. And then also, you know, some tactics to make sure that you keep getting invited back because, you know, going there once is great, but being the first person on the game organizer's call list is even better because then you're always have access to the games. If you get kicked out, not so good, not so good to, to lose access to really good games. Um, and there's some, some pretty good coaches here at pokercoaching.com. I don't know if you've heard, but, uh, they have the number one online tournament player in the world as of March 12th, 2021. Um, Bert Stevens, James Romero, who is a crusher. He's been on the podcast multiple times. Faraz Jaka, legend of the game. Mr. Jonathan Little, also been on the podcast three times. Also the founder of pokercoaching.com. You've got myself. You've got Alex Assassinato Fitzgerald. Tommy Angelo, just a human that I could not love more. Tommy Angelo, Elements of Poker author, just one of the le living legends of the game and somebody that has been influential to just so many poker players and has been influential to the folks who are very influential in the game as well, like myself and Jonathan. Um, Jonathan Jaffe, Matt Affleck, Tristan Wade, Michael Acevedo, the author of Modern Poker Theory, um, which is the, uh, the new poker Bible. Um, Lexi Gavin, Evan Jarvis, Ryan O'Donnell. I, I think that's all the poker coaching coaches. If I left anybody out, I'm sorry. I blame the creator of this slide. I take no responsibility myself at all. There's also 1,200 quizzes on pokercoaching.com, which is quite a few quizzes. Um, and you can see that they're by a wide spectrum of people. I've personally made at least 60 quizzes. They're not up on the site yet, but one day after you buy in this Father's Day sale a year membership to pokercoaching.com, you're going to wake up and you're going to find 60 quizzes by me um, just resting, nestling there in your poker coaching dashboard. And this is it. This is the final slide. Uh, poker coaching premium. Gives you all the tools and training you could ever need to achieve your full poker potential. You also need the willpower to dive in to use those tools to upgrade your game, take responsibility for your poker education. Um, and if you're not completely satisfied, let us, and by us, I mean Jonathan Little and the poker coaching team, not me. Don't let me know. Let them know. Um, and they will give you a refund. They don't allow me to be in charge of the money. Unfortunately, I've begged them. But they just, eh, they just, they just, they just won't. So, message them. I'm hope you know I'm joking. Um, but yeah, message them if you are unsatisfied in any way. It's a free roll. Pokercoaching.com/fathers. Somehow it's five fifty three. We got seven minutes for the Q's and the A's. Let's see what we have up here in the chat box. Um, your big betting river, both for value and as bluffs, which is balanced, but is it profitable? Um, I mean, in most spots, like you seek balance, you want to have bluffs and you want to have some value. I think that's, uh, just in general, solid poker theory. Um, now if you have information that leads you to want to Deploy exploitable strategies, so opponent is either over calling the river, so they call too often, or they fold too often, then you're going to deviate from the balanced strategy. Um, if villain is always calling the river, 
then you probably don't want to bluff, right? Like that's kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, but yeah, it, basically the more balanced you are in those spots, um, the harder it is to play against you. You're not, uh, if you have always have value or always have bluff, it makes you pretty easy to, to play against. Um, Assassinato suggests on the river we should be sizing our value bets to what villain will be paying off because getting paid off on the river contributes so much to our bottom line. That's true. But the follow-up question is how do we know um, what villains will be paying off, right? And I think that we can test this. Um, again, like I haven't said this, but keep track. You know, any data is good data as it relates to poker. So you need to be paying attention to the thresholds that in which villains are calling the river, um, paying attention to hands that you're not in, right? You can learn a ton by just observing, being focused, not watching the ball game on TV, um, just not watching Netflix on your phone while you're sitting there playing, paying attention to the hands that get shown down so that you have data points that allow you to navigate more successfully. Um, David Garner said, I just signed up for the poker coaching premium with Father's Day sale. Can I access the past webinars coaches have presented? Yes, sir, you can. You can access the past webinars. That That's the thing. We have all, they have all the webinars there, I think. Um, Nicholas asks, Nicholas Lawhorn asks, when flopping sets on dynamic boards, heads up out of position, what are some things we should consider when deciding to check raise, check call, or lead? Um, you should be you should be considering the villain profile. Is the villain likely to barrel off on lots of turns and rivers? Will the bear will, will the player that you're playing against recognize that most players are check raising the flop with their sets, which leads to over aggressing on turns and rivers? Um, or is villain more passive and likely just one and dunning with their bluffs, not likely to invest more money, likely to check behind and over realize equity, in which case we should be check raising the flop. So the villain profile that you're playing against, the size of bet that they use, all of those data points uh, ought to be taken into consideration and then prioritized. Um... When I shot take at 2-5 from 1-3, I noticed the main regs in the game literally never bluff shoved the river. Um, I don't know how you know that, that they literally never bluff shoved the river unless you call down every single time and you see that they never have a bluff, right? Uh, it's hard to, hard to know, but it's quite possible. And the reason why regs in those games may not bluff shove the river is because they've bluff shoved the river before and gotten called inappropriately which has led to them changing their strategy to not bluffing the river enough and if they're not bluffing the river enough that's great for you because then you can overfold when facing these river shoves uh home game 2-2 two -two, open raise in early position a lot of flat calling no three betting it's so better to start limping with good value and try to three bet more when it comes back around. I don't think so. I think that the one thing you gotta, you just gotta do is learn how to navigate multi-way pots. If you're playing in these games where you have lots of callers, instead of blaming the callers and blaming the world and shaking your fist at the clouds when they get lucky with their six eight off, um, learn how to prioritize data points and multi-way pots really dive in and bear down and figure out just how to play multi-way pots better. Because guess what? You're going to be in them no matter what you do. There is no way around it. You're just trying to kind of go around being uncomfortable. You can't, you, you can't avoid being uncomfortable. You got to be uncomfortable. Um, and then you just have to, uh, yeah, you just, just got to do the best that you can. And that's that. I uh, ran out of steam there at the end. Uh, I guess, don't know if we have any more questions. And we've seen you. My pleasure, Mr. Lawhorn. Um, we've seen you today over Bet the River, both as a bluff and for value. In one case, you were trying to get one pair to fold. In the other case, you wanted one pair to call. Hard to know when to do it. It's true. You need to, you really need to think about 
uh, managing your bluffs. How many bluffs do you have to manage? I think in the pocket tens hand, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot more available bluffs on the river than we did the ace nine with the ace of spades hand. So really, it goes back to having available bluffs. Um, and so when you're trying to val when you're trying to make somebody fold, uh, you want to have a lot of available value, few available bluffs. And then when you're trying to get somebody to call, you want to have a lot of available uh, bluffs, um, and not a ton and much less available value, right? So it's just in the perception uh, that villain has of your range. Steve Z says, "Do I think more cash games will start using a big blind ante? I think uh, I think more cash games should use an everybody ante. Um, I, I think that like that's something that." Cash game platforms, just in general, got to do a better job of uh, mixing up, mixing up the structure of cash games. You know, this is the year 2021. For goodness sake, we had the do seven off game on Ultimate Bet back in 2007, um, which is like cooler and better than anything that we have available in the U.S. market. So, poker platforms, get your act together and uh, start being a little bit. It's not even innovative. Just start trying a little bit. Just like try try a little bit to give us some more fun games to play to mix up the structures. And uh, we're officially over now. Do I buy in at the largest stack of the table? Dean, this is a loaded question. It depends on what stake I'm playing. It depends on how I view the relative skill level of the opponents. If I view myself as relatively more skillful, then um, the opponents I'm playing against, then I'm fine buying as, as the largest stack. If it's unknown, you know, you can always add more to your stack as you play. You can't take money off the table though, right? So you can buy in for 100 big blinds, check it out, pay attention, get some data points, understand the strength and the ability and the level of the players you're playing against before making that decision. Um, Ken Sin says, excellent session. I enjoy all of your training. Thanks for sharing the knowledge. My pleasure, Ken Sin. Um, happy to share my knowledge with anybody whose name rhymes. This is a thing that's near and dear to my heart. So Ken Sin, well done. Uh, we have a Bradley Little here in the chat. I don't know. I guess that's just coincidence, but well done. Well done, Mr. Bradley Little. Uh, and I guess with that said, we got no more cues, so we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to end the stream. Oh, Craig Hoffman, just right under the gun, right? Right under the gun. 1-3 uh, game with a 300 max buy-in. What's the advantage to those who buy in for 100 to 200? Um, maybe they just know how to play short stacks well. I, I mean, I don't know exactly what the advantage is, but I think like the major advantage of buying in with the short stack is understanding a solid, good short stack strategy when your opponents don't, and so they're likely to make more mistakes. Um, so, yeah, that would be the uh, that would be the read that would be the possible advantage to buying in for a hundred or two hundred. Um, with that said, I don't think it's necessarily great at 1-3 because the rake will eat you alive. Um, Bradley Little just jumped in. That's his legal name. Well, well done, sir. Well done. Your your mom did a great job um, with your first name and pretty good job with your last name, but a great job with your first name. So with that said, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to click the end stream button here. Oh, where's the button? I don't know where the button is. Oh, here we go. We're going to end the stream. Peace out. Have a great weekend. Um, happy Father's Day. Again, pokercoaching.com slash fathers. I'm Coach Brad Wilson. Check me out on Twitter and the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. I will see y'all next time.